So we talked about a few examples uh, and introduced the concept of data parallelism and task parallelism. Uh, next, we're going to uh, look at two uh, important concepts, concurrency and parallelism. Concurrency um, is where we have two or more activities happening at the same time. So in this example, we have two threads. Uh, let's ignore the, you know, the details, whether this is software. Uh, actually, th these are software threads, but you know, that's not important here. The concept here is that uh, we have two or more activities happening at the same time. And these can um, um, be on different processors, or even on a single processor. In this particular case, we do not require these two uh, threads to um, be executed on separate hardware units. So what could happen is, in this example, these threads are all being executed. Think of these are tasks that are all being executed. They have not finished. Uh, but in reality, uh, the way the hardware executes them is uh, kind of time sharing. So at some point, uh, this processor executes the instructions from thread one, and then switch to thread two, and then uh, at some point, uh, it will switch back to thread one, and so on. The things we emphasize here in this example is that these activities are happening but we do not really require them to have um, uh, to be executed uh, at the same time. They could be sleeping. Uh, they could you know, wait for another chance to be executed, but that's okay. That's so-called concurrency. Parallelism is uh, more um, strictly to say that, um, yes, these two activities, two threads, are being executed. Um, the task is not finished yet. But these two threads are actually on separate hardware uh, execution unit, could be CPU, could be FPGA, and they are being executed at the same time. And that's uh, uh, how we strictly uh, you know, describe the parallelism uh, or in parallel. Um, this you know, little diagram uh, illustrates these concepts. Uh, so uh, the parallel programs are the true um, execution activities as happening on different uh, hardware resources. So if you look at time scale, these uh, multiple tasks, they are actually happening at the same time. Um, probably some of you have heard of this before, Amdahl's Law. Um, this is uh, a very classical uh, formula used to calculate the uh, theoretical speed up. When we try to explore the inherent parallelism by running these tasks uh, on multiple processors uh, or multiple um, processing units. What we're saying here is um, you know, a way to calculate the speed up. The speed up is um, basically the uh, original execution time or old execution time or so-called the, the execution time on a serial um, processor uh, divided by the execution time that you uh, could have if you run this task on uh, n parallel, uh, on n processing units in parallel. Um, what we are seeing here is that, uh, you know, given a task, you could have some portions of the task that has to stay in serial. And in contrast, the rest of the portion that can be uh, redesigned uh, so that they can be carried out using multiple processing units. These processing units could be GPUs, could be FPGAs, could be uh, modern cores. Uh, but you know, there's some portion that we cannot parallel, uh, make it run in parallel, but some of the um, portion that we can um, run um, in parallel if we are given any resources. So the speed up uh, is calculated as one over this b, b being the um, portion of the zero uh, execution uh, in per, um, percentage, and this one minus b is of course the portion that can be uh, carried out in parallel. And this 
1 over n is to say, okay, if we have an ideal design that we can use n processors to speed up this parallel portion, then what will be the new execution time? So the zero time plus the new execution time due to the parallel computing. Uh, so this becomes the new um, total execution time. Of course, you can you know uh, then convert it into uh, a new format to remove the denominators or simplify the denominators. Okay, so in theory, we know what is parallelism, parallel uh, execution, and how do we calculate the speed up. Now, we have to realize these concepts. Uh, it turns out that you know, people have been doing, trying to do this for a long time. Since the early days of microprocessors, uh, we're talking about you know, Pentium processors, uh, you know, maybe even earlier. Um, so during that time, um, um, the vendors, Intel and other companies, actually trying to do some sort of parallel uh, computing within the processor. In a traditional processor, in particular the CPU architectures, we often think about instruction level parallelism. Because if you um, take a program and look at the sequence of instructions, I'm talking about the binary uh, instructions uh, in the program, there are actually many instructions that are independent. Of course, that heavily depend on um, the actual workload that you execute, the program you write, the task that you want to achieve. But there can be a lot of uh, instructions uh, within the instruction stream, and they can be executed in parallel. And that's what we call instruction level parallelism. High performance CPUs often have a large amount of logic, uh, so called the superscalar, or out of order hardware, to exploit this instruction level parallelism. Uh, there are many uh, you know, uh, tricky and, and clever uh, things you can do uh, to look ahead, to look, look at all the um, instructions uh, ahead of time to figure out, okay, if, if I'm executing instruction one and instruction from 10 to 15 down the road, they don't seem to be dependent on instruction one. And these instructions can be, you know, pulled uh, to execute earlier. The earlier they finish, the earlier your whole task can be accomplished. So that will improve your performance. In our class, uh, we focus on different type of parallelism, not the, at the instruction level. Um, uh, instead, uh, these um, parallelisms that we focus on are at a much higher level. And this is the task parallelism and data parallelism that we try to exploit uh, by looking at the applications and also try to uh, see how we can design the algorithms uh, to um, take advantage of the inherent parallelism. In OpenCL, we'll see that tasks can often correspond to different kernels, and data parallelism is exploited by multiple software threads within the kernels. Um, I think I throw in the concept uh, too early, but just you know, give you some heads up that, you know, what we're going to deal with uh, using OpenCL. We talked about decomposition. Um, we have task decomposition, uh, data decomposition. Uh, either way, it helps to um, have formal concept for determining the parallelism. So we're going to talk about uh, these two decomposition uh, methods. Task decomposition is to divide the algorithm into individual tasks. Uh, in this case, we don't focus on the data. Instead, we focus on the operations that we need to perform, or we can perform uh, at the same time. Uh, on the other hand, data decomposition is to divide data set into discrete chunks that can be operated on in parallel. Task decomposition reduces algorithm to functionally independent parts. Uh, this is highly dependent on the actual 
um, application, the algorithm. Um, but when you decide to decompose into different subtasks, keep in mind that these tasks may have dependencies on other tasks. Um, if the input of task B is dependent on the output of task A, uh, then we call task B is dependent on task A. If tasks don't have dependencies, and of course that's very nice uh, for us to leverage, uh, we can execute these tasks in parallel because the later task does not need to wait for the data coming out uh, from the earlier task. Task dependency graphs uh, are very useful in describing these relationships, dependency relationships between tasks. As you can see that we have uh, two simple example where on the left, um, B is dependent on A, and the figure on the right shows uh, A and B both depend, um, sorry, C de is dependent on both A and B, but A and B themselves, they two are independent because there's no, um, no one is trying to, um, no one have to wait for the data from the other part. These um, dependencies can form uh, a larger uh, graph uh, to um, help you understand the um, operations, the important operations or important steps that you can perform uh, as a part of your solution. And this will give us a hint, you know, what can be done in parallel, what cannot be done in parallel. Das, uh, sorry, data decomposition. Uh, data decomposition is a technique for breaking work into multiple uh, independent uh, tasks. Um, but each task has the same responsibility. We here focus more on the data. You can uh, think about this task, even though they are being executed uh, at the same time, they themselves are actually the same operation, uh, and they work on different parts of the whole data set. Using data decomposition um, will allow us to exploit data parallelism. And in OpenCL, uh, data decomposition will help us to uh, map the uh, data parallel problems onto data parallel hardware. Uh, again, uh, this concept is a little bit early um, to explain um, further, but um, just give you a hint where we're going to go. Now, to find out how we can decompose the data, we can aim at you know two directions. Um, for most of the problems, scientific and engineering problems, applications, data is decomposed based on the output data. So we're going to look at the output data. What are we trying to compute to see, okay, how we can divide uh, the data into different um, tasks for compute? Here are two examples. First one, uh, let's do uh, image convolution. Image convolution is basically you transform one or uh, the original image into a new image. Uh, you can you know, do uh, segmentation, do um, uh, try different shading, etc. Uh, but these type of uh, applications, uh, you can look at the output pixel. You perform some kind of operation, convolutional operation, to on the original pixels or subset of the pixels, and using these operations, you will eventually get a new pixel. So if you look at from the output point of view, each output pixel corresponds to an operation. And these operations are basically the same for all the new pixels. So you can um, then find out, okay, how we can uh, decompose uh, these data um, into different groups or partitions. Another example is the matrix multiplication. The output element, you can start from that. The output element will um, be computed using uh, the corresponding row of uh, matrix A and column of matrix B, if you multiply A and B. 
And of course, those rows and columns, those numbers are the you know uh, the ones that will um, be used to perform this dot product operation and generate the new element in the uh, result matrix. So that gives you a hint, you know, how we should partition these um, original data. So we need to partition the original matrix A into um, row vectors, and then for the matrix B, we need to look at the column vectors. Um, this technique is, I'm talking about this output data decomposition. This technique is valid uh, for cases you know, based on one-to-one -one mapping or many-to-one uh, mapping. So you have one original data, you know, generate one uh, output data, or, or many uh, input data generating one uh, output data. So the second way you can uh, look at data decomposition is to look at the input data. It's similar to look at uh, to uh, the case that you look at output data, except that uh, here uh, these kind of algorithms that we should use input data decomposition tend to have this one-to-many mapping. So if you have one input data through some sort of computation, it corresponds to you know multiple output data. For example, uh, his histogram histogram is um, created by placing each input data into one of the fixed number of bins. So for each input data, you need to check for uh, its property in all these possible output bins or output um, buckets to find out whether this uh, input uh, should be in bucket one or bucket two. So you have to uh, do this one-to-many mapping. Uh, also, the search function that takes a string as an input, look for the occurrence of various substrings, uh, also falls into this category. For this type of applications, each thread or each um, task uh, can create a partial output of the output, and uh, you need to use synchronization uh, and sometimes atomic operations uh, in order to um, gather these intermediate data, uh, be able to compute on them at the right time, and eventually generate the final result. Um, because if you um, don't use synchronization, some tasks may run quicker, some tasks may run slower. If you don't wait until all the subtasks complete. The result you're trying to aggregate is incorrect. So oftentimes for this type of tasks, you will need uh, synchronization operation. 